everyone to our last talk of the day in the career fair. Now that we've been introduced to the world of lab-grown meat by Maria earlier, our next speaker, Brianna Duffy, will help us dive deeper into the world of agriculture and sustainable food production. Brianna is the Research Operations and Outreach Director at New Harvest, a new global nonprofit that supports pre-competitive research on cellular agriculture. She holds a bachelor degree and PhD in biomedical engineering, where she focused on tissue engineering for medical therapeutics. Growing alarm over the environmental crisis and global food insecurity led her to cellular agriculture, where she uses her background to help build a more sustainable and equitable food system. Let's hear from Brianna about her journey in the world of cell agriculture and how you could someday be part of it too. Brianna, you can begin. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for the opportunity to present here and talk a little bit about my personal career journey. Just grab my slides. Okay. All right. So I'm excited to talk about my uh, own personal career path from traditional tissue engineering for medical purposes to uh, cellular agriculture. So I'll just start right off the bat with my career path and where it started. It started with my bachelor's degree on the western side of the United States, uh, where I studied biomedical engineering. So I was initially drawn to this field by um, medical devices that could replace entire organs or parts of organs, such as the total artificial heart. Um, but it was here that I fell in love with tissue engineering, fascinated by the vision of engineering a real organ. So this passion led me to Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts for my PhD. And here I studied cardiac tissue engineering. So although we're pretty far from being able to grow an entire heart, uh, cardiac cells are one of the most rewarding to grow. Uh, you get these nice self-beating tissues, which is really fun. But despite the thought of working with beating cardiomyocytes and, and the importance of heart disease, I started to become increasingly concerned about another problem, climate change. So as I was in the lab, I watched as the world saw more fires, floods, and droughts, and the associated hunger and migration and unrest that was threatening people and species around the world. So as I became increasingly alarmed by climate change, I decided that I needed to make a career change. I wanted to help address climate, but I wanted to use my background in science to do it. So this left me wondering, where could I possibly start? There are so many different climate solutions that you could pursue, as Ryan Jennings has beautifully organized here in a way that us scientists can truly understand. Uh, transportation, buildings, and electricity are all especially prevalent and really where I first met the field, but I couldn't find myself personally connecting with them for a career. I'm a biologist and I love to study living things. So ultimately I realized that food is where my passions lie. Food for me is the perfect combination of my interests in health, science, and the environment with a large impact on climate change, especially when you're talking about animal agriculture. So we've known for decades that animal agriculture is a leading driver of climate change with beef as an extreme example. So this graph shows the average global greenhouse gas emissions from a variety of foods. Each color is shown on the top representing a different stage of the supply chain. So emissions from most animal products are significantly higher than from plants primarily derived from the emissions that come off of the farm, from the feed that we give the animals, and from the land that we clear to raise them. So despite this, global demand for meat has only risen in the last six decades, especially as developing countries have reached higher economic standards where meat consumption also rises. To meet this demand, animal science has made incredible strides to optimize the animal. This study shows the dramatic change that we created in broiler chickens in just 50 years through intentional genetic selection. So we have made a really efficient chicken, but unfortunately it's just not enough. Despite optimizing the animal, industrial agriculture causes environmental degradation in addition to its greenhouse gas production. In case you thought that this was a microscopic experiment at first, the left is actually thousands of cows in an industrial feedlot, and the right is the resulting waste lagoon from their runoff. Within that farm, animals are packed together in such small spaces that the risk of epidemic viruses and antibiotic resistance are at an all-time high. In 2019, a quarter of the world's pigs were killed due to African swine fever, and we've actually seen a recent spike in cases just this summer. 
And finally, animals raised under these conditions are not properly treated, with horrifying realities to raising animals in such a concentrated manner. So we understand that our food system needs a transformative change in order to feed our growing appetite for meat without these negative impacts. And there is a technology that could be part of the solution. Cellular agriculture means that we could have our eggs without needing to raise hens and our milk and beef without needing to raise and slaughter cows. So cellular agriculture, as you might know from the previous talk, is the production of agricultural products from cell cultures rather than from whole animals. So taking milk as an example, it is traditionally sourced by first artificially inseminating a cow, housing it in an industrial feedlot, and milking it. But milk is just a mixture of proteins, fats, sugars, and minerals dissolved in water. So using microbial cells and the genes that we know for each protein found in milk, we could produce milk without needing the cow at all. On the other hand, meat is just muscle. Muscle tissue engineering has been occurring in the medical space for decades as I was studying in my PhD. So we could produce milk, meat by taking a sample of cells from the animal and growing them in culture. So I discovered that this field used the same tissue engineering concepts that I'd been trained in for a decade. The cells are selected, in the case of meat, usually from muscle and fat cells. These might come from stem cells or primary cells from a biopsy of an animal. The cells then have to attach to a surface, so we provide a scaffolding material, giving them three-dimensional structure and pattern. Then we feed them a nutrient-rich media and culture the entire tissue in a bioreactor until it grows and matures into a muscle, or in this case, maybe a steak. But with cellular agriculture, you add in a whole other aspect of food science with its own unique set of considerations. For example, you may care about food safety as opposed to biocompatibility. Many things that aren't safe to implant are safe for our digestive systems to handle. But on the other hand, not everything that we implant is actually edible. You also care more about flavor, texture, and nutrition, more so than tissue function. And a major difference is that the cost of food products needs to be a lot lower than the cost of pharmaceuticals. So it's challenging science, but these products are being realized. On the right is the world's first cultured meat burger, eaten at a tasting in 2013 and costing over $300,000 to produce. Today, the field has over 100 companies with over a billion dollars of investment. The two products on the left are actually approved for sale. The um, Perfect Day milk proteins in the United States and the Just Chicken Nugget in Singapore. So while we're these are still more than your normal chicken nuggets, at about $20 for the dish, we're get starting to get there. And these technologies have the potential to solve a wide variety of challenges that agriculture faces right now. These claims from Perfect Day show how lower greenhouse gas use um, from lower energy use could curb climate change, while reduced land and water usage could allow for rewilding of our ecosystems that have been taken over by industrial agriculture. So back to my career path, I found this incredible field that matched my skills and ambitions perfectly. Now I needed to find my place in that field. So how many times have you been asked, do you wanna go into academia or industry? That's the big question that every graduate student faces, honestly, at nauseum. But the truth is there's more than just two paths. There are many other paths. And the one that I took was one that I'd never really considered before, a nonprofit. So why did I end up at a nonprofit? Well, I was asking myself, how can we ensure that cellular agriculture delivers on its promised benefits? Farmland that's allowed to rewild and sustainable meat production facilities that look more like breweries than slaughterhouses. As the study on the left shows, sustainability isn't guaranteed. There's a large difference if the field is built on sustainable energy sources shown by the left circle versus conventional power in the right circle. This is an opportunity that we have to build the field in a sustainable way, not a guarantee. Furthermore, what about creating a more just food system that works for everyone? For example, in this recent paper, the authors investigated how cellular agriculture could be an opportunity to democratize ownership and participation in the food system, deviating from the global food monopolies that have emerged with industrialization. For that long-term impact to be realized, we have to build the field towards that goal now. This industry is very mission-driven. It's so heartening to talk with the founders in this field who almost all entered it for the same reasons that I did. But startups aren't usually in a position to focus on long-term impacts like sustainability or just food systems as much as they may want to be. 
This isn't to harp against industry. We need industry to have products. But when your money comes from investors, you have a responsibility to them first. If not, you just have a responsibility to your mission. Industry can't do benefit without profit first. Obviously, this graphic is very oversimplified. There are many organizations that fall somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. But right now, the field of cellular agriculture is dominated by industry innovation. In the classic biotech scenario, as shown on the left here, this first wave of early research is largely fueled by public funding. This creates an education and knowledge infrastructure for the entire field and perpetuates open innovation and discourse throughout that field. However, public funding is almost non-existent for cellular agriculture because it falls through the cracks between funding for medical and food sectors. Because of this, this industry is almost entirely based on research and development from the private sector right now. As I mentioned before, building the field in this way is inherently profit driven. In addition, this innovation at startups is behind the closed doors of intellectual property and trade secrets, creating a lack of transparency. This is especially problematic if we're talking about a technology that we intend to radically transform how the world grows its food. So over the last few years, leaders in cellular agriculture have formed nonprofits all over the world. These nonprofits help to contribute to the community infrastructure that is needed in the field. I wanted to highlight a couple of resources from other nonprofits that I think could be really useful to anyone that's considering entering cellular agriculture. So Cellular Agriculture Australia has created a wonderful tool that you can use to help you find pathways into this field, whether you're just starting your education and want to figure out the right major, or if you already have a skill set like I did and you're looking to see how you could apply it. Next, the Good Food Institute State of the Industry reports are a great way to get an overview of the industry side of the field and are released every year. Next, I'll talk a little bit about what we do at New Harvest. So New Harvest's mission is to maximize the positive impact of cellular agriculture. Cellular agriculture will be incredibly disruptive to the food system, but whether or not that disruption is a positive thing is far from guaranteed. We believe that we can't let the market drive that impact. We need to intentionally build positive impact into the field starting at the beginning. As the Shuttleworth Foundation states in their book, when the goal is to create something that is beneficial for the world rather than beneficial for the market, everything gets reconsidered. So to achieve this mission, we need systems of accountability and transparency in the field that allow safe products to be brought to consumers worldwide. We also need a collaborative space for ongoing innovation and discourse that steers the field to the positive impact that we envision. If everything in the field is occurring within the um, closed doors of industry, then that ongoing discourse and innovation isn't going to happen. So we have three main impact objectives that we use to achieve these goals. These are empowering emerging leaders, mobilizing the ecosystem, and collective value creation. Throughout all of this, our overarching goal is to cultivate 100 leaders by 2025. We call this our 100 leader bioreactor. We believe that it is people, more so than any individual project, who are going to propel continued impact far beyond what we could do as a single organization. So to start, we directly empower emerging leaders through our research grants. To date, we have supported 50 emerging scientists across the world. Many of these students and postdocs are the first at their university to study cellular agriculture, and their work has not only contributed knowledge to the field, but has also brought in other researchers and expanded the academic research in this area significantly. Through this, we've also mobilized the ecosystem, creating an academic research field devoted to cellular agriculture, which is going to give that public infrastructure that's needed. The research portfolio of our grantees is diverse, covering the five main scientific topics of cells, scaffolds, media, and bioreactor, but also other areas such as food safety and sustainability. This work creates collective value in the field through the generation of open access information that's contributing to the public body of knowledge for the whole field. We think of this as a rising tide lifts all boats. If we can create more public knowledge about the field, we can increase transparency and further innovation. In addition, we achieve these impacts by serving as a convener of stakeholders in the field around key neglected topics. One major example of this is our 2020 safety initiative. This was an industry-wide initiative to address the shared pre-competitive research gap of safety. 
To do this, we convened representatives from 50 companies around the world, which at the time represented over 60% of the global industry. In a series of workshops and one-on-one -on -one engagement, this group of industry representatives generated a collective understanding of the cultured meat manufacturing process and identified key food safety questions. These considerations normally would have occurred within the silos of each individual company. By creating an open discourse, this allowed for a shared understanding that applied to the entire field, mobilizing the ecosystem around this important topic. The results were also outlined in a collaborative paper that has already spurred ongoing conversations around the world. This paper is an example of what we consider collective value creation, where the results of the initiative are far more powerful because it is a collective understanding from the field, not just one organization's opinion. So what do I do as the Research Operations and Outreach Director at New Harvest? Well, it was important to me that I was able to use my scientific background, and luckily I used my technical knowledge that I gained from my doctorate in pretty much everything I do, um, especially to help our organization work with the wide variety of stakeholders in the field. Through this, I serve as a bridge between stakeholders, which often leads to collaborative projects, such as a webinar for policymakers or writing collaborative technical papers. I also answer a lot of questions. Um, where do these cells come from? Are these foods going to be vegan? And not all of these are as clear cut as you would expect. I also review our grant applications for both technical feasibility, but also their potential to empower leaders in the field. And finally, I do do a lot of normal operations to keep our research program going. With a small team of only 10 people, we each wear a lot of different hats. So the big question I wanted to try to answer was, what is it like working at a nonprofit? So in summary, I get to use my PhD skill set, but not actually in the lab. So I will admit I did get a little bit burnt out on the actual pipetting after graduate school, but I found this role to be a way that I could apply my background in so many different ways, which is really exciting. And when I first considered working for a nonprofit, I thought I would be accepting a life of being underpaid and overworked, but I'm happy to report that is not the case of all organizations. As an organization that cares about people, not just profit, New Harvest embodies those values externally and internally. And technical talent, such as what all of you guys have, is really valuable, not just in industry. And I really want to emphasize how fulfilling it is. I am so thrilled to say that I have found a role that is both fun and fulfilling. For a long time, I thought I'd only be able to have one, either a challenging, a scientific career that really interested and drove me, or fulfillment that my work was making an impact in the areas that I was most concerned about. To be honest, there were times when I thought about leaving my PhD program to pick an entirely new direction, but I'm happy to tell you that there are avenues where you can find that balance um, and transition your scientific career into um, something else that you're interested in. So I'm happy to chat more with anyone who's trying to enter cellular agriculture or potentially just trying to make a major career shift. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Brianna. That was amazing. <laughs> I love this talk. So we can uh, start reading some of the questions. So Nentara asks, do you think cellular agriculture would dominate the future or would other meat alternatives such as plant protein extract, soy mushroom based alternatives be equally important for a sustainable future? Uh, especially keeping in mind that expanding conventional agriculture can also cause ecosystem destruction due to farmland expansion. Yes, um, I fully believe that it's just part of the solution, that we're going to need all of these different solutions if we're going to actually make an impact on the various areas, climate change, ecosystems, health. Um, we're really going to need every tool in our toolbox, and this is just one of them. And the other side of that, uh, your comment about ecosystems, is, again, where this needs to really be um, mission-driven from the start. I mean, we could create these technologies that use less land, but if we don't have the policies in place to then use that land for rewilding or to give it back to indigenous peoples or more sustainable farming practices, then that could just be taken up in another non-sustainable way. So we really have to work as actors from every part of this field to make sure that it's positive. Yes, that's like Javon's paradox, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so Atmika asks, thank you for your amazing talk. 
What would you say is expected on the resume of a student fresh out of his or her PhD who is trying to apply for a job in a nonprofit organization? Will some job experience be needed to apply for a job in such companies? So if you're specifically asking about a nonprofit, um, I would say they it's going to depend on the specific nonprofit. So not every nonprofit has the exact same focus areas that we have. But in our case, we care a lot about your ability to communicate because, as I said, you're using your technical knowledge, but with that wide variety of stakeholders. So if I'm talking to a scientist in the field, I'm going to use very different science communication than when I'm talking to the press or talking to a undergraduate student who's just entering the field. So science communication is a really big piece of that, being able to translate your deep technical knowledge that you got during graduate school into something that can help the nonprofit work with all these stakeholders. Um, the technical knowledge, I think you probably already have, but of course that's important on your resume. And um, the ability to collaborate and wear a lot of different hats, I would say. As I said, I mean, we're a small team and I think most nonprofits are. And so you have to really be able to do a lot of different things and juggle that. Um, so I know for my resume, it was really helpful that I had done more than just research in my undergrad. I had done some sustainability projects on campus and run those. And that was, I think, really helpful in my resume. The next question is, as you mentioned earlier in your talk, developing countries are emerging to be major contributors to global meat consumption. Often these developing countries could also present major sociocultural barriers, notwithstanding religious barriers, to transitioning to lab-grown meat. What are your thoughts on approaches to overcome these barriers? Yes, and that is really important to think about. When I entered the field, another consideration I had was that I could see this field just becoming another high-tech food for like the Silicon Valley rich people. And that's not what we're looking for. But if we want to create a food system for everyone, we have to get their input from the start. So that's part of why I showed that map of nonprofits around the world, because it's so important that you have people that know the local culture and know what that area needs to have this technology be beneficial. If we don't have those people at the table during the conversations at the start, then we can never expect these technologies to apply to them later on. So that's such an important piece of building it right now. Um, and I also personally feel like this idea of democratizing ownership is really important too, because if we have industrial food monopolies like we currently have in a lot of industrial agriculture, those foods oftentimes aren't making it to those people. And if we can democratize ownership and create smallholder farmers that could be growing cultured meat using maybe the cow on their land at the backyard or small local breweries of meat that are in a community and are very community oriented rather than just grown in the United States and transported worldwide. That's the vision that we're looking for. But we have to bring those people into the conversation now. Yes. I love this answer. <laughs> Sinem asks, do you often collaborate with other nonprofits and share information with each other to drive the research faster and further? I think you touched on this a bit in your talk also, right? A little bit, but I will say a lot of these nonprofits are really new. So this is kind of a, an exciting new frontier of Salad where we've started having more of these nonprofits around the world that we can start to communicate with. So I definitely would say that that is growing and we're looking forward to doing more of that. That's great. I think it's very important that uh, such initiatives communicate with each other instead of just compete. So that's mm -hmm. great in a nonprofit. The next question is from Mariana. So first, thanks for the amazing talk. Could you talk more about how high is the greenhouse emission profile of products from cellular agriculture compared to plant-based alternatives like soy milk or veggie burgers? Yeah, I would direct you to that study I cited there by CE Delft, as well as a few other studies that have come out recently. But generally, I will say that it's not guaranteed, kind of my story of my whole talk. It really depends on how we build the field. So if we use, uh, I would say at baseline, it is not guaranteed to be more sustainable than your tofu or um, plant-based burgers, but there are ways that we can build the field more in that direction using sustainable energy, looking at circular economies, we're building the supply chains in a sustainable way. Um, but another aspect to consider is that we're actually, this field is not meant for the people who are already vegetarians. Like they should continue to be vegetarians. That is probably the best option. 
but there is just such a huge population of people in the world that want meat and meat is so culturally important. We can't expect everyone around the world not to eat meat. So I don't think it's going to necessarily be better than plant-based alternatives, but it is a piece of the overall solution. Yes. Uh, Mohammed asks, do you think cell-based meat as a model for cellular ag agriculture may change the epigenetic profile of humans and change the human microbiome, for example? That is a great question. And I believe that that is something that was brought up in the safety initiative is how do these products potentially impact our gut? And so I would say it's possible. Um, epigenetic profile, I know a little bit less about, but these are just some of those open safety questions that we need to address. We need more research that's looking at this. But in theory, it will be largely the same. Um, and it will just depend a bit on our inputs that we're putting into the manufacturing process and how much of that is still present in the output. Um, Nentara asks, scientifically, how do you assess texture and taste of lab-grown meat? <laughs> That's a great question. And that is the side of that Venn diagram that I'm still learning more about. Luckily, have some colleagues that are more of the food science experts than I am. But I do know that there there are specific like rheological technologies and assessments that you can use to assess texture in a lab. Um, taste is a really interesting one. I think there are a few kind of chemical assays you can use to assess how something might taste in a lab, but eventually you do have to eventually taste it. So as I said, there was that 2013 tasting of the first cultured meat burger. So things like that are important. Um, I don't think they decided it was perfect. We have still a long way to go to get taste. Right, but um, there is an interesting combination of lab-based technologies that have been used in the food sector for a long time that can be applied to this field to assess those in the lab. Um, the next question is from Rebecca. She asks, have there been any work into making fortified meat products as in improving the nutritional profile according to the needs? Oh, sorry, it's been moved up. Okay, to the needs of the population. Yes, I love that you asked this question because this is such an interesting avenue that I didn't even get a chance to touch on in my talk. Um, but as we're engineering these food products, we can engineer them to be exactly the same as the meat products that currently exist or animal products, but we could also engineer them to be better. So there's this huge door of opportunity where we could make meat that is healthier. The fats are healthy fats rather than the current fats that lead to heart disease. Um, or we could fortify them with other nutrients. So I would direct you to um, one of the No Harvest Research Fellows um, who is looking at adding fortified nutrients to cultured meat that could potentially help with this um, and nutrient deficiency around the world. And so that's Andrew Stout at Tufts University. Um, Shairini asks, which type of products can be produced by cellular agriculture? Yeah, I mean, it's really limitless using um, the technologies that I described. So using tissue engineering, you could produce animal products from essentially any animal. There's even um, companies that are looking at foods that are not as commonly eaten because we've really been kind of siloed into just these foods that have been grown in intensive agriculture. So um there are companies that are looking at foods that are less common or even foods that are extinct. There's a company that um, made uh, gummy bears from the uh, proteins from an extinct animal. So the, it's just really interesting what you could do, but everything from uh, steak and uh, pork to seafood, um, milk and eggs, they all have their own unique challenges, but they all can be created using tissue engineering or fermentation. Um, we, want, we were wondering if you would like us actually to just continue here with whoever would want to come on stage, like instead of uh, having a separate session for speed dating. Whichever you would prefer, whatever you think will be easiest. Because if this is the last session, so it would be, you know, a bit redundant if we opened another link. So if anyone else has more questions and would like to also share uh, to open their camera, they're welcome to do so. Um, I would like to actually ask a question. How do you feel, like, how hopeful are you for the future of these products? Thinking 
like what frustrates me right now is that um, political leaders still um, give subsidies and uh, invest more into industrial agriculture when we know that we should move away from this. And actually there are a lot of barriers in a place for people who, with initiatives like yours. So how would you overcome this? Yes, that's a great, a great question. So that's actually a lot of what we are doing right now, building off of the safety initiative from last year. We are initiating something similar where we're more focused on those questions of, okay, what is the vision that we are hoping to reach and what are the barriers we see right now to reaching that vision? So I would say that I don't have all the answers yet, but we are actively talking and engaging with stakeholders around the world to try to answer these questions. And the truth is it's going to involve, like you said, in bringing in policymakers and really changing policies, both in the kind of front end, like you said, with subsidies, as well as the back end with how does this land that's freed up get used and how do we make sure that these products are um, democratized worldwide. So it's gonna be very challenging and we need to bring in more people than just the scientists at this point. Um, but I will say we're starting to see more interest. Um, we're starting to get interest from governments and intergovernmental organizations who want to learn more about this field. At this point, most of them don't really know what it is. So we're at the point of just kind of explaining the technology, talking about the concerns, and then hopefully getting to some of those uh, policies you talked about. Um, another question I would have is related to yeast grown milk, because you mentioned Perfect Day. I'm actually a fan of the company. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if you have any knowledge of uh, the comparative environmental impact of yeast milk versus plant-based milk, because yeast, I would assume, is much less environmentally harmful than lab-grown meat at the moment. That is a great question. I cannot say any stats off the top of my head for you, um, but I do think that that is likely true because it is a simpler technology um, and fermentation is a technology we have been doing for a very long time. So I, I do believe that that potential is there, but milk um, herds that are used for milk production also have a lower greenhouse gas emission than herds that are used for beef production. So you're also looking at what are you comparing to? So that's a great question. I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but I'll look into that. Um, just a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I will uh, add to my okay, answer okay. about, <laughs> oh, on. I was just going to say, to add to my answer about how to join a nonprofit or anything, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to chat offline. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Mariana asks, is it uh, also part of your job to talk to politicians and governments? What are the challenges when advocating cellular agriculture and policy? Yeah, so there are different types of nonprofits. So New Harvest is specifically a type of nonprofit that does not engage in lobbying. So there is a bit of a difference there. So we don't actually lobby to uh, politicians or governments um, in a way that some other organizations do. We more serve to help give them information. So like I said, we've given many talks to um, health agencies in governments to explain what this technology is and help answer their questions about their concerns, really trying to be an unbiased entity within the field that people can come to for knowledge. There are other organizations that do engage in lobbying, um, and I know a little bit less about that, but would be happy to connect people. Um, yeah. um, I think Nantara wanted to come on stage. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I also, uh, hi. great talk, by the way, very interesting topic as well. So um, I wanted to ask that uh, you said most of your funding comes from um, public funds. And um, do you think, is, is it just funding as from a think tank or is there also a translation in immediate policy for integration into utilization or is that something which they're still waiting for, you know, research to first come and then they'll kind of translate it into something in terms of policy? 
Yeah, so I'll clarify a bit. We don't actually receive much public funding yet. There is still a massive um, gap in public funding for this field. So at least the US government only recently has given its first grant to research in this space. That was to UC Davis for the Cultured Meat Consortium. But uh, so most of our funding actually comes from donors. And so that ranges everywhere from small donors who are giving monthly for like $10 to some larger philanthropy organizations that donate to us. So it is still private, fu private funding, but it's not like a startup where they're expecting a return on their investments. They're just donating to you for their mission. Okay, thank you. And one more question. Mm -hmm. So you also spoke about how you need community engagement in the future to make it a more acceptable form. So there's also a large section of society, for example, which is strictly against GMOs and modified crops. Any sort of scientific touching with their food is just completely no no to them. So do you also have like people working on how to maybe convert, you know, such an ideology into something that says that we need scientific fortification and we need these changes to actually be able to live in a sustainable manner? Yes, that's a great point. So many people in this field are constantly referring back to GMOs and the challenges that GMOs had with consumer acceptance. And there's a lot of interesting dynamics in how they're treated in different countries. And so you can kind of look at how people might look at this. And so um, I was the technology is going in both directions. There are a lot of companies that are strictly staying away from GMOs because they know that that's such a hurdle with consumer acceptance and regulatory acceptance, actually. In Europe, um, it, you really they won't approve anything, or it's much harder to have things approved with GMOs. Other companies are still using GMOs and hoping that they can, um, with with consumer education and transparency and going about it differently, have a better outcome. Um, and that's where we believe that transparency piece is so important. Is if we don't have transparency in how these foods are created and what these technologies mean, then no one is going to trust them. It is kind of a weird concept for sure. Um, we also acknowledge that the average consumers are probably not the first people who are going to be trying these products. Um, and we're not even attempting to get them there. <laughs> we There's going to be a small subset of people who have been following this technology for a while and are interested in it that are going to try it first. And then slowly that will hopefully open up more consumer acceptance. But education is a really big piece of that. We have some grantees research fellows who are working with GMOs and looking at how can we improve communication about these technologies so that it's more transparent and understandable for consumers. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. If anyone else wants to ask something before we close the session. Maybe you have something to add, Brianna? Um, Maybe what would you say to someone who is uh, having an ambition of joining this field? Well, first, I always direct people to that resource from Saudi Agriculture Australia. It's a wonderful resource to really kind of break down the field into the different facets and where your skill set might fit with it. Um, and I would imagine that almost anyone at this conference has a skill set that would be applicable to sell ag. Um, just something I've kind of heard from the field. I mean, there's a lot of, if you're looking at industry, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, for example, material science or um, cell engineering. And a lot of those people go, especially the cell engineering or media development is a big area as well. Media is the uh, largest component of the cost because you have to refresh it so often um, that we really need to bring that down. And those areas, oftentimes students come out of grad school and go right into pharma. And so it's actually been hard for the industry to fill those positions um, with people that have that really deep technical knowledge. And so there's a lot of opportunities for people in this field to enter cellular agriculture. And if you're interested in more of the impact side, like I wanted to do, um, it's really more of, like I said before, about being also a science communicator and looking at the bigger picture, but still tying that into the technical knowledge that you know. I mean, to talk to policymakers and help answer their questions, you have to understand how tissue engineering works and how, how uh, fermentation works. And so it all ties together. Yes, thanks a lot, Rihanna. That was really, really nice and a really beautiful discussion. Thanks everyone for participating. 
So I guess we can now close the session if you have nothing to add. No, just thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you everyone for the wonderful questions. Thank you to Brianna for being here. Okay, so I guess we can close now. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye.